Hello, thank you for tuning in. I'm really excited uh, to present this conversation with Sam Vatkin. Um, you've probably heard of him. If you haven't, he's got a YouTube channel and the link will be below. So I'll set some context, um, but first some housekeeping. Um, so if you're interested in circling in the Circling Institute, uh, we have a drop-in event every Thursday night from six, six to nine, it's on Zoom. And we have a weekend coming up in, in two or three weeks. Um, and, uh, uh, and also the Art of Circling, which is a, the year-long practitioner course, uh, which the, the current one just got over full. And so we opened registration for this one and this will be on Zoom again this year. So if you're interested in that, uh, go ahead and links for below for all of those things. It's all on the Circling um, Institute webs website. If you're interested in working with me one-on-one -on -one, um, with, uh, with coaching and consulting, um, go ahead and email me. My email's below. All right. So Sam, this was an extraordinary conversation with Sam. It was, um, I knew it would be great, but it ended up being quite profound in, a, in, in ways that I wasn't anticipating. Um, we, we, well, first of all, Sam, Sam is a, a, he's a psychologist, he's a physician, he's, uh, he's um, uh, what else is he? He's got a degree in, in physics, he's a philosopher. Um, so, that I think that already says a lot. Uh, extraordinary mind, extraordinary being, and quite the character. He's got his own YouTube channel, um, which has gotten really popular. And he basically put, from my understanding as a psychologist, um, he basically put the, the, the notion of, of narcissism and the narcissistic disorder and all the distinctions around that really on the map of psychology. And he's written um, a bunch of books on it and he does videos um, on narcissism and a lot of things on psychology. Um, in this conversation together, this is our first one, uh, we talked a lot, we go deep into um, society and technology, right? And He's got some very interesting thoughts and perspective, perspectives on basically Heidegger's notion of uh, Gestell in the age of technology. And he has some twists. He, he said some things that I am gonna need to sit with and, um, and consider for, for the next couple of weeks. And then I wanna have another conversation to have him on again. Cause I think he's saying some things um, that I haven't quite heard in this way before uh, that seem really rich. And I wanna, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be having some more dialogues um, to, 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 to bring these ideas out and, and, really, and really discuss them and flush them out and in, 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 in go into dialogue. Um, so that especially the connection between technology and narcissism and the narcissistic disorder and how basically the internet and technology um, has become what we call the world. And so we'll be go, you know, this conversation goes deep into that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna be having more conversations where we go even more deep, deep into that. He's got an incredible mind and uh, a lot of wisdom. So enjoy the conversation and um, there'll be more coming. Uh, this uh, links for his channel is included in the show notes. All right, enjoy. I'm recording theoretically at least. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope for the best. Absolutely. Let's, we don't want this to be lost to posterity. Right. So I, I really enjoyed your, um, uh, man, I thought I'm, I'm still sitting with it. I just watched your, your interview 
you being interviewed by, um, I think the guy with an, I think he has an Irish accent um, about social media. All, all interviewers online have Irish accents. <laughs> it, it's part of the job description. <laughs> I was, I mean, when you talked about a few different things, I thought it was really astute in a, in a way when you talked about where there was one thing that you said that I thought was just, um, it really struck me was what people who grew up on the internet, right? Um, they actually, I think what you said was what, where they find reality, what they call reality is online, right? The simulation, right, is, is walking around in their life. And, and to me, that, that seems to be the, that seems to be the fundamental change I'm seeing, right, in the world. And it's, it's very difficult for people to notice because, mm -hmm. right, especially I think because the change, I, I don't know, uh, like uh, it's a change and it's like an ontological change, right? That's happened so quick that I don't even think that parents and teachers and right, the society is, it can even, can even perceive a change that's happened so deeply, so quickly. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just absolutely um, an astute, an astute and telling uh, thing that you said. Well, I'm first of all devastated that you found only one thing I said a student and you're telling <laughs> that's a serious narcissistic injury, which I hope to recover from during our conversation. But may I may I comment on what you said? Yeah, please, please. Um, um, throughout throughout human history, mm -hmm. and of course the history of metaphysics, to allude to your hero worshipping mm -hmm. Heidegger. Mm -hmm. um, throughout human history, we have had this propensity to make a distinction between the world of appearances and the ostensibly real world. Right. So we had the Platonian ideal forms. Mm -hmm. We had in Christianity, the afterlife mm -hmm. preceded, preceded by the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. uh, and to be followed by the kingdom of heaven. And today we have cyberspace. Cyberspace is the natural successor to all these, to this human proclivity to split the world in two, the world of illusion and the real hiding occult essence, which mysteriously is never accessible. Never mind how hard you try, even with instruments such as reason, or its derivative science and so on, we keep failing. We don't touch the quiddity, it seems. We keep failing somehow. And so having failed repeatedly, we are traumatized by existence and we revert, we escape to the world of illusions. Mm. And so I regard cyberspace as the, the heir, the successor to the medieval, the medieval concept of heaven. Hmm. To to the afterlife, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. your life is just a corridor. Yeah, it's it's a kind of paracosm. Paracosm means imaginary kingdom, usually infantile imaginary kingdom, where you have imaginary friends. Right. So cyberspace is um is the kingdom of heaven, writ large and brought down to brought down to earth. It has extreme religious undertones and overtones mm -hmm. and because it is it is like that it's a digital platonian cave yeah i i for example differ substantially different and possibly i'm the only one mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge i mean i'm not trying to aggrandize myself but right. i couldn't find compatriots <laughs> right so basically you're saying i'm, I'm not trying to aggregate you know grandiose myself but if the fact is a fact right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm the only one. Doesn't mean, by the way, that I'm the only one may 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 mean that I'm stupid, not right. that I'm, you know, may go right. the other way. Right. But I'm the only one who seems to claim that cyberspace is not about appearances right. and not about 
not about spectacle yeah. and not about simulacra. Mm -hmm. I mean, borrowing from uh, the board and, and, mm -hmm. and similar. But that actually the power of cyberspace, the bond, the attachment, the addiction to cyberspace is because it is about ideal forms, not about appearances. Mm. Now that would, it's about essence, not mm. about appearance. Now that's, that's a kind of, um, kind of uh, topsy-turvy view of cyberspace because everyone is telling you cyberspace, that's, that's show business, that's appearances, that's yeah. simulacra, simulacrum, that's, uh, you know, yeah. that's a spectacle, society of the spectacle. Yeah. Everyone is telling you this. Yeah. But I think had this been true, mm. we would not have seen silos we would not have seen echo chambers. We would not have seen the vehemence mm. and aggression that cyberspace provokes. Mm. People are defending their essence when they are on cyberspace. Mm. People are communicating their quiddity, their essence, and they are becoming aggressive and they're becoming defensive and they're becoming revengeful and they're becoming psychopathic mm. and they're becoming grandiose. Right. Not because they deal with appearances, Right. But because they actually deal ill forms, they are they are defending what they perceive to be their essence, mm -hmm. and this sits well with previous cyberspaces like the afterlife in Christianity, right. like Platonic ideal forms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So huh. this is one way of of uh, looking. I I have I I want to just to to finish this response. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hog to hog too much of the conversation, and I do want it. I do hope to have a dialogue and a conversation. But I want to say one thing. Turing was the first, the first to unearth, if you wish, mm -hmm. to disclose, mm -hmm. <laughs> the first to unearth the uncanny affinity between humans and computers. Mm -hmm. Humans are the only form of being, not in the Heideggerian sense, right. only entity, yeah. only form of being that is a universal machine. Hmm. I mean, even Heidegger and the existentialists, and they tell you that you can yeah. self-determine, that, that yeah. being is the unfolding of potential futures. And you can be anything. You're not a rock. You're not a, a lizard. You can choose to be anything. You can choose to be a serial killer. You can choose to be an author. You can hmm. choose to be... In this sense, you are a Turing universal machine. Mm. We had come up with this, the only second instance of a universal machine. That's mm. the computer. The computer is us. It's a reification of being human. Yeah. That's why we have this un incredible bonding, unbreakable bonding yeah. with the computer. Yeah. Because we are the only two universal machines in the world right and this is uh, this takes us somewhere but i'll let you <laughs> let you yeah, do some so, so i want i just want to make sure i'm getting what you said so that's that's striking so the the so the common so the common view of social media and computers and the internet is is that it's all about appearances it's all about right mm -hmm. the, the, the shadow right um shadow on the wall the spectacle and so the, what you're saying is, is it actually, maybe it's really about, it's not about appearances, but it's about universals. It's about ideals. It's more than universals, it's essence. Yeah. It's more than universal. Right. It's essence. It gets very, very close to the sign. Yeah. Very close. Right. Um, but it lacks, it lacks certain elements. For example, the internet is ahistorical. Mm. It's ahistorical. Mm -hmm. So it can't be the sign. It has no dimension of temporality. Yeah. Also, it, it's also infantile. So the internet, if you want to choose a philosopher, a philosopher of the internet, long before the internet, mm -hmm. Nietzsche, of course. Right. Nietzsche would have loved the internet. Yeah. Because it's the child, it's the child beast. Right. The child beast. Yeah. Who is high historical, not historical. Right. And it's it eliminates the distinction between the world, the platonic distinction between worlds of appearances and the real world. Yeah. It merges them. Yeah. And what I'm trying to say is that the internet had accomplished this feat first time in human history. Mm -hmm. 
because computers are us. Mm. Compute, we and computers, these are the only sentient or pseudo-sentient or quasi-sentient life forms which are also universal machines. Now, if you read Turing's original paper about universal machines, mm -hmm. you realize, and later Tarski, Tarski's elaboration on universal machines, okay. you realize it's not about computing. Mm. It's not about reasoning. Mm. It's about being. Right. Um, right. Uh, the universal machine is the only machine which can unfurl and unfold numerous future potentialities because it is not limited yeah it is not limited it's not one purpose machine right so it comes it comes very close to sartre mm. sartre perception or sartre relationship between existence and essence right the universal machine is not a machine that was designed to accomplish a purpose mm. it's not its essence did not precede its existence. Yeah. Its existence preceded its essence. We don't have any friend. Why do you think we are looking for aliens? We are looking for aliens because we are lonely. Yeah. We are very lonely. Right. <laughs> and here we came up with, we gave birth to yeah. another life form, which is us. Huh. It can, we finally found a friend. We are finally not alone. <laughs> the, the the internet, and more so the more social social media, right, is the first time in human history, first time, absolutely in human history, that we are truly not alone, because we try to assuage our loneliness by inventing imaginary friends in paracosms. So we came up with God. Yeah. We then came up with his son, a Jewish carpenter. Yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We came up with a lot of nonsense, right. trying to assuage our loneliness. Right. And even even rigorous thinkers like Heidegger, mm -hmm. whom you clearly <laughs> you yeah. are in accord with. Yes. Even Heidegger. Yeah. Has extreme religious undertones and overtones. Oh yeah. Totally. Heidegger. Heidegger pretended to to have divorced Christianity. No way. It's yeah. a Christian. Work yeah. is a Christian work. Yeah. So we we couldn't divorce ourselves from these imaginary friends within these imaginary kingdoms because we were lonely. Right. Loneliness right. was described perfectly by Marx borrowing yeah. from others. Yeah. Via the processes of alienation, right. reification, reification, fetishism. Yeah. These are all lonely phenomena. Huh. And then suddenly we came up with a computer. And lo and behold, it's so much like us. Right. We can be friends finally. Right. And we we made friends, steadfast right. friends. Right. And we we have an unbreakable bond which yeah. deepens by the day. Yeah. Because both of us, humans and computers, were not designed for a purpose. Right. Existence preceded essence. And so now we can choose our futures. Right. Um, you know, freely. Is the element of freedom, the Southian freedom. That's interesting. Uh, I so in some sense it's similar to it reverse. I think what I'm, I'm hearing you say is it is it the invention or the development of the computer and of the internet. Yeah, because usually it's like, for example, we don't build a from another perspective, we don't build a, you know, we don't invent a shoe. And then figure out that we can wear it. We, you know, it's like mm -hmm. we have the need, and then we respond. And so, true, true. and so, what you're saying is, is it actually with with computers? Is that we've developed a computer? We first created a computer, and yeah. then we found out what to do with it. Yeah, we didn't know what to do with it. I mean, had you asked Turing if you had the the, the fortune of meeting Turing, one of the greatest minds ever, by the way, huh. if you were to ask him about video streaming? Yeah. He wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. Right. And that's the father of the computer. Right. If you went even further back to Babbage, yeah. she and he wouldn't know what on earth are you talking about if you were to mention, for example, JPG. Right. We first invented the universal machine. That's why Turing called it universal machine. It's a purposeless machine. It's right. a machine without purpose. Right. Existence preceded essence 
yeah. precedent purpose, precedent function. Right. Same with human beings. Sartre says, when God, when God came up with human beings, yeah. he didn't come up with human beings um, for a purpose, for two reasons. First of all, there was no God, he says. There had, there's no God. It's a right. piece of fiction. Right. But had there been a God? Had yeah. there been a God? You, you know, humans didn't. There was no blueprint. There was no shoemaker who said, okay, now they are feet. They have to be clothed. I'll come up with a shoe. Mm -hmm. Right. First, he made humans. Right. And then humans discovered pornography. Right. I don't think the maker, if yeah. there ever was a maker, had in mind pornography. Yeah. This is the Heideggerian unfolding of the design, the right. future potentialities. This yeah. is the temporality that, uh, to link to link yeah. with your ling lingo. Yeah. 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 This is the and so uh, computers are beings in instantiation of beings not being not the being but instantiations of being they are beings yeah who share with us our if you wish our attitude to design so yeah. only two beings in heidegger's time yeah heidegger said there is one privileged being mm -hmm. that privileged being is the being that asks about being right he said the entity that poses questions about being yeah we need to study that entity we need to study this entity because it's the only entity that asks questions about being. And now, had I Heidegger lived now, he would have chosen two entities. Mm. We, computers. Oh, interesting. This explains the symbiosis. Yeah. This explains the cyborg because we have become cyborgs. Right. Can you live without your smartphone? No. Really? Right. Do you really think so? Try. Yeah. No. Yeah, we have merged. We have melded. Yeah, we are enmeshed. Right. We are one. Right. We are one. Right. This raises another interesting question, and, and mm -hmm. since we are one, mm -hmm. we can never have any essence that is not that is independent of das man, the the they. Mm -hmm. I mean, Heidegger made the distinction between. You know, right. that's man, man the right. they, and right. so while pre computer mm -hmm. theoretically it was possible to reach an understanding of your being from inside or yeah. imminently, yeah. imminently, yeah, today it's not possible anymore. You must involve another entity, a second entity, yeah, and this, of course, leads to narcissism. I was just going to say, precisely, that, yeah. narcissism. Right, it's right. Precisely narcissist. Right. The difference between a narcissist and a healthy non-narcissistic person right. is that the narcissist crucially depends on at least one other person mm -hmm. and has two selves, not one. Right. So narcissists are the natural bridge between pre-computer era and our computer era. And gradually, we are all becoming narcissists because we all begin to have two selves, yeah. our self and the computer. Right. The computer is becoming our secondary self. Yeah. It's an open question now whether the self is real, not real, organizing principle. Mm -hmm. Let's leave this aside. Let's use colloquial language. Right. We all feel that we have a self. Yeah. We all feel that we have a core, okay? right. some nucleus wrongly or rightly it's an outcome of introspection yeah so we use when we introspected we used to come up with one self if we were lucky if you didn't have multiple personality disorder you would come up with one self right people prior to the computer age came up with one self mm -hmm. today you must come up with two selves to provide a total description of who you are yeah to provide your specs you must come up with two selves, you and your computing devices. Yeah. And so this is identical to narcissism. Because if you ask the narcissist about his self, mm. the narcissist comes up with two selves, yeah. the true self and the false self. Right. Narcissists long before the internet, long before there was an internet, already were dichotomous. They already entertained the dichotomy. Hmm. True self and false self. Right. And now everyone has a false self. Yeah. Everyone has a false self. 
and that's the computer, the internet. Yeah. Wow. I the the bridge but the, when you just talked about like we need the narcissists to bridge to bridge ourselves over to the computer that that this this we are becoming narcissists. We are becoming narcissists. Right. Yeah. And in, in, in we are all. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, excuse me, just maybe to clarify. Yeah. Um, we all acquired willy nilly a second self. We didn't want to. We didn't plan to. Right. It was not in the cards. Right. But we all ended up with two selves. Right. Our integral, constellated self, psychological self, let's call it. Yeah. And our mechanical, technological self. Now, of course, the mechanical technological self is the false self hmm. for very various reasons, which we can go in, into later. Mm -hmm. So we all now, all, even children age two, yeah. all have a true self, which is our psychological self, yeah. what Jung calls the constellated self, yeah. and a false technological self. Yeah. Everyone has it today. Yeah. Because everyone has this today, everyone appears to be narcissistic. That's why we make the mistake and we believe that internet is about appearances. Mm. Because everyone has two selves. When we look at people, we say, wow, they're narcissists. They are taking selfies. Yeah. They are posting on social media. Yeah. They are concerned with themselves only. They are self-infatuated. Yeah. It's not this. Yeah. It's not. It's that they are all interacting with their second self. It's an inner dialogue. When you are interacting with the internet, you are not interacting with an external um, existence or something. You're interacting, you are, you are internalizing a dialogue. Right. You're creating an internal dialogue, which is naturally externalized because that's what narcissists do. They have an internal dialogue between true and false self, but it is the false self that is externalized in order to obtain narcissistic supply. Right. To cut a long story short, technology had transformed all of us without a single exception yeah. into the psychodynamic equivalent, equivalence of a classic narcissist. Yeah. And so the, and, and I think what you're saying is the conditions of possibility dwell that, that we would, right? that we would create a computer, that we would do this, right? The conditions, uh, what, what does it reveal about the conditions of our, you know, you could say our design or our, our state of being? What is, and I think what I'm hearing you say is that we're, so it's actually, hang on a second, one second. So, so it's like- <laughs> I seem to- I'm re-, I'm re, I'm re <laughs> you completely. <laughs> you are you are ready for the classic. You are ready for the classic presentation. Internet is about appearances. This, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, this is a really. I mean, it, it's a very. As you say it, it intuitively it, it intuitively makes sense, and it's. I have to. Re, I have to really call on my dyslexia to kind of <laughs> to, to to sense it. Because I think. Let me well, let me maybe yeah. yeah yeah please sorry if you have something more to say I'm no please yeah please, please go yeah. I'll shut up yeah. of course here there is reason to call upon Heidegger because in the late forties nineteen forty nine and so on he made a few very pertinent and interesting observations about technology uh, which right. entered the discourse and and today there are people don't even know it's Heidegger. But yeah. so they discuss technology in its role. Let me try to put it from a psychological point of view. I'm yeah. a little like Carl Jaspers, yeah. psychiatrist and, and philosopher. So, yeah. you know, mixture. Right. Uh, let me try to put it, from, um, have a look at it from another point of view. Yeah. Heide Heidegger spoke about technology in the same terms that Louis Althusser later discussed interpolation. Louis Althusser discussed interpolation mm -hmm. as the force of society, the message of a signal sent from society, which alters your behavior and so on. And to a large extent, Heidegger regarded technology more or less the same way. Yeah. Technology regards everything and everyone as 
potential source for exploitation. That's the reserve, the famous reserve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's one way of looking at it. That's blaming technology. That's yeah. technology shaming, yeah. <laughs> which is very popular nowadays. Right, right, right. That's technology shaming. It's yeah. not my game. Yeah. It's not my game. I think throughout human history, yeah. and here the work of Heidegger and others about yeah. the history of metaphysics is very crucial. Nietzsche the same. Yeah. He did yeah. great work on the history yeah. of metaphysics, morality, and so on. Right. Morals. So, but my, my point of view is a bit different. Mm -hmm. I think throughout human history, there was a titanic struggle between two organizing principles. Mm -hmm. Titanic. Mm -hmm. It's not resolved. And it can never be resolved, in my view. That's speculation. But I think it can never be resolved. Right. It's, um, it's a struggle between two principles, two organizational principles. Mm. Either you organize being and also reality mm -hmm. using a principle of individuum, individuality or individualism or individuum. That is the equivalent of the atomic theory in physics. I'm a physicist as well, so I'm entitled yeah. to use these metaphors. Uh, atomic theory in physics says... Wait, wait a minute, were you a physicist too? I have a PhD in physics. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. I didn't know I that. have a PhD in physics, PhD in philosophy, <laughs> medical doctor. <laughs> I spend all my time studying. <laughs> wow. I'm the eternal, the eternal student, you know, procrastinating, wow. delaying the inevitable adulthood. Yes, yes. Uh, coming back to, to this. So the principle of individuum yeah. is the equivalent of atomic theory, which is essentially Greek. It's not, you know, mm -hmm. atomic theory. And that is the belief that ultimately there's an indivisible particle. And not only is this particle indivisible, it is also a con constitutive particle. It's a constituent. If you amass these particles together, mm -hmm. you're going to get the world. Mm -hmm. So it's very deterministic. Hmm. And even if there are emergent phenomena, which you could not have predicted from the qualities of the particle, hmm. it still doesn't negate the particle's constituent status. So yeah. this is one approach. Yeah. Modern psychology, starting with the psychological experimentalists, mm -hmm. the German psychological experimentalists in the 19th century, right. and Freud's attempt to scientify psychology, you know, yeah. psychoanalysis. Right. And other behaviorists, the behaviorist school. So modern psychology in general is an atomic theory. Mm. It's the belief, it's the belief that we are all, each one of us is an indivisible particle. Mm. And that if we put all of us together, right. we get society, we right. get we get hyper phenomena, we get uh, high emergent phenomena, epi right. epi phenomena. Yeah. So if you put many, many individuals together, you get society. Yeah. So, but each individual is an indivisible particle akin to quark in today's physics. Right. Indivisible particle. Right. Right. So this is the individual. Hmm. And you start from the individual. What you teach in university today, you start with personality theory. Yeah. You don't start, you don't start with social interaction. You don't start with social psychology. Yeah. Japanese philosophers try to reverse this trend. Right. They try to say it's wrong to focus on the individual. You should focus right. on social relationships and yeah. so on. But it's a, it's a lost cause. All right. modern psychology is founded on the individual yeah. as an atom. No right. wonder we are atomized and lonely. Yeah. But, but there is another trend. Mm -hmm. And this is the titanic struggle. Mm -hmm. And the other trend is choosing the world. So you have a choice. You choose can choose the, the self. Uh -huh. You can choose the self, that is the atom, the indivisible atom. Yeah. You can choose the self, yeah. or you can choose the world. Right. If you choose the self, you cannot choose the world. These are mutually exclusive propositions. Yeah. If you choose the world, you cannot choose the self. Now, here is the irony. Choosing the world is narcissism. When you choose the world, mm. you actually delegate delegate the regulation of your internal environment internal landscape psychodynamic processes state of mind you delegate all these things to the outside yeah, to the world yeah the world becomes 
your agency. Yeah. The world, the world is your efficacy. The world, you become utterly a derivative right. of intersections among elements of the world. Right. Now this leads on the one hand to psychosis mm -hmm. and on the other hand to narcissism. Mm -hmm. Because what is a narcissist? A narcissist is a person who depends crucially on input from other people to regulate his internal environment. Right. A narcissist is someone who had chosen the world. Right. He has a hive mind, right. a hive mind. Right. He has a mind, kaleidoscopic mind, which comprised, is comprised of input from a thousand million people. Yeah. So he's, he's assembling right. like right. a kaleidoscope, he's assembling. And he derives his sense of being, not in the Heideggerian sense, uh -huh. in the psychological sense. Yeah. He derives his, his existence. He yeah. derives his sense of being yeah. from, from this aggregate input of, from others. Right. Narcissism, narcissism is to choose the world, ironically. That's... To be healthy is to choose the self. But then you pay a price. It's exactly what Walter Benjamin said. If you decide to be happy, you can't love. If you deny suffering and the suffering of others, you cannot love. Right. And you're doomed. You're doomed to be an atom. You're doomed to loneliness. Right. If, on the other hand, you embrace the world, instantly you suffer. Because the world has the suffering in the world. Yeah. Instantly you suffer, but then you're capable of love. Yeah. Because your suffering resonates with other people's suffering and you're capable of love. So here's the choice in stark terms. Right. You can choose, you can choose to be healthy, mm -hmm. to have a self, mm -hmm. and to be doomed, to be doomed to existential solipsistic loneliness. Or you can choose to be a narcissist, to embrace the world and to be in principle capable of interacting with the world. Right. Benjamin used the word love. Narcissists wouldn't call it, wouldn't engage Walter, in love. Walter, would Walter, engage Benjamin. In... Walter Benjamin. Okay, gotcha. Um, a narcissist wouldn't, Benjamin in <laughs> proper pronunciation. Mm -hmm. A narcissist wouldn't engage in love. He would engage in fantasy. And this is where we are right now. We had chosen narcissism. We had chosen the world. We are sacrificing the self. Mm. We are sacrificing our atomization mm. via social media. Mm. But then we are capable only of fantasy. We chose fantasy, the fantasy of connectedness, the fantasy of in-betweenness. We chose this fantasy over the alternative of health and strength and super, Nietzsche and Superman, loneliness. We don't want to be lonely. Right. We prefer to not be. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah, enjoy. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> leads us to a very shocking conclusion. Mm. Um, a very, very shocking conclusion. Right. It flies in the face of a lot of established philosophy. And here's the conclusion. If you want to embrace the world, if you want to be in the world, your only choice is narcissism. Mm. But narcissism is a bad faith, inauthentic choice. Yeah. To embrace the world, you must become inauthentic. Yeah. You must have bad faith. Yeah. It's the only way to embrace the world and only way to be in the world. Right. Right. So, Narcissism, as I said before, to remind you, narcissism is the delegation of functions which usually should have belonged to a coherent self, yeah. delegating these functions to other people, right. thereby creating a bridge between you and other people, interacting with them. Right. So narcissism is a mode of communication with other people. It's being in the world. But to do this, you must have bad faith and you must be inauthentic. Right. You must have bad faith because you have, for example, an external locus of control. Your life is controlled from the outside, not from the inside. Mm -hmm. Because 
yeah. you must abrogate you must abrogate personal responsibility Sartre. yeah you must abrogate deny personal responsibility and your ability to find meaning by yourself because your ability to find meaning to make sense of your life yeah like victor frankl yeah the ability to find meaning yeah. is crucially dependent on other people it's you don't control this yeah so you delegate you delegate yeah. the meaning to your life to other people yeah the meaning of your life to other people right. you delegate yeah. responsibility to other people yeah you delegate control to other people yeah you can then say it's not my fault yeah they made me do it right i was following orders right they made me do it yeah they are the ones who doomed me to my fallen to my fallenness yeah yes right fallenness the inauthentic one right yes these yeah. are narcissistic states right but where i differ from heidegger and others mm -hmm. meloponti and so on mm -hmm. is that they said that it is an undesirable state okay it is it is an undesirable state if you are willing to renounce the world Mm -hmm. If you are willing to adopt a monkish, solipsistic position, yeah. Ironically, if you follow Heidegger's reasoning, you end up with the count. It's psychologism, extreme psychologism. Uh, that's the irony of Heidegger. That's right. why. That's why, in my view, he had the turn. At some point, Heidegger mm -hmm. realized how self-defeating his arguments are. He yeah. realized that he ended up with the cult via Nietzsche. He right. realized that he ended up with religion and right. with God. He realized that he that actually what he is advocating is solipsism and and so on. So yeah, he recoiled. At some point, he recoiled. And if you read his mm -hmm. work, yeah, he renounced the early yeah. Heidegger almost right. completely. Yeah, the turn. And so mm -hmm. the turn. Yeah. So. Um, this is the stark choice we're facing right. you want to be healthy you want to have a self you want to have personal responsibility you want to define the meaning of your life mm -hmm. you want to choose your pot to realize the potential mm -hmm. of the, your future potentials mm -hmm. you want to be a player right you want to be a player in your life right you must renounce the world you yeah. can't do this with other people yeah you must renounce the world completely right the cow that's Cartesian. Mm -hmm. cogito yeah. ergo sum only me oh, totally only yeah. me the rest is doubtful you know yeah. this is one thing or or mm -hmm. now you have another pathway with computers and so on you have another pathway right you embrace the world you embrace the world but then you lose yourself right you embrace the world and you delegate to the world your identity your essence yeah. your meaning yeah. and your future potentialities right in other words hmm. you become an absence unbeing um uh -huh. there was um there was a german school of thought in philosophy uh -huh. the nones like no nine yeah yeah so you become yeah. a no yes you right. become a no right you don't become an up a presence or a being but you become a no yeah uh, uh, not the sign, but the man. Yeah. In yes. a way. Yes. You, yes. you become a multiplicity, right. not a singularity. Right. That's to borrow from Kurzweil. Right. You, you become a multiplicity, yeah. not a singularity. Yeah. And this is the power of social media. This is the power of the internet. Right. This is a profound shift in human psychology. We don't understand it. We right. will understand it in 100 years. Right. This is not another instrument, another tool similar, I don't know, to television. Yeah. No way. It's not. It's an artificial surrogate self. Yeah. It's a, it's a portal. It's a portal. It's a gateway, which for the first time in human history gives us the real choice. Yeah. Coming back to Sartre. Yeah. The real choice. For the first time, we are empowered to make the choice. Do you want to be you or do you want to be they? Right. 
if you want to be you, you will be alone for the rest of your life and you will never know, never know love or anything equivalent to love. Okay, this is for the Superman. That's the Ubermensch. Mm -hmm. Or you choose they in the Heideggerian sense. Yeah. You choose they, right. you become fallen, you become inauthentic, right. you become, you adopt bad faith, yeah. you become narcissistic, but you're not alone. You're not alone, you belong. Right. You interact. Right. You interact, you belong. Right. And everyone around you constitutes yourself. Yeah. They give you, they hand you yourself on right. a silver tray. Yourself is given to you. Right. Right. It's given. Right. It's gift in German. Yes. Yourself is, is given to you. Right. In the first choice, you must constellate yourself. It's a it's a construction project, never ending. Construction project. You must be strong. Yep. You must be resilient. With nothing essential underneath it. Right. So it just continually right. needs reification, right? There's nothing, there's nothing right, because it's, it's a potential. Yeah, it's a potential. Yeah. In the first case, you really, really must be strong, because first of all, you never arrive. It's asymptotic. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. asymptotic. You never make it. Yeah. And you're in constant process of construction, and you have only yourself to talk to. Yeah. You can't consult anyone. Yeah. Only you. You have your, only your own resources. Yeah. So, and you construct yourself, an asymptotic self. I mean, gradations of self. And this is. This is the temporality of the sign. It's the emergence of the possible futures. Yeah. And, and no wonder, no wonder Heidegger had such close affinity with the Nazis. Yeah. Because Nazism was about this. Never mind now. Let's not enter the issue. Was it evil? Was it not evil? Right. I'm not in the business of, of giving, right. of labeling. Yeah? Right. But the philosophy of Nazism was a philosophy of extreme, extreme remaking, becoming, extreme becoming. Yeah. So Heidegger, on the footsteps of Nietzsche, he would deny it, of course, on the footsteps of Nietzsche, yeah. Heidegger came up with the, with a method to become an Ubermensch. Nietzsche, Nietzsche just said, it is the last man, and now we have an Ubermensch. Hello, we do it. Where did the Ubermensch come from? Right. How can we transition to the Ubermensch? Yeah. Give us some methods. Tell us, I mean, how to. Give us how to manual. Right. He, he left that unspoken. Mm. He left that an enigma. Mm. The Ubermensch in Nietzsche suddenly appears out of nowhere. And you don't know where the hell did, did he come from. Right. It is Heidegger who told us how to become Ubermensch. Huh. He gave us the methodology to yeah. become Ubermensch. Right. We're not going to it right now in details, but so this is the choice you're facing. Ubermensch or uh, last men, perpetual last men, yeah. constellated by society, by morality, by others, by history. By right. The Ubermensch is ahistorical. Hmm. The last man is embedded. Embedded. Yeah. And while in the past we could be embedded with five people, today we can be embedded with 50 million people. Yeah. The Trump supporters, Trump's right. base. Right. This is embedded. So today we can safely delegate. There yeah. are so many millions of people who will take care of our needs. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the process, will hand us ourselves. What are we doing? We are outsourcing yeah. the constellation of the self. Yeah. We have we have subsumed, yeah. We have consumed the internet and assimilated it. Yeah. We are inseparable. Right. Inseparable. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. And we are all, by definition, therefore, narcissists. Right. Right. So I'm, you know, it's interesting because I have a, uh, I've. I've worked with families before where I'll go in and, and um, like basically move in for a couple of weeks. Right. And, and just be an attempt just to dwell in the family and then work with them live as it, as it happens. And 
which is, I mean, I can talk, you know, for a thousand years about that. It's so, it's so some of the most fascinating experiences I've ever had. Um, I've learned probably the most from doing that. But there was, there was one family I worked with where the, 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 the son was so isolated, right? On one level where he would, it was literally what he called reality, right? Was his, his games on the computer, right? So he'd go to school and he wouldn't talk to any of his friends, right? He wouldn't talk to anybody. He, he like, he didn't bathe that well, right? All that. And then, but then he'd come, he'd come home and he'd get on the computer and he would only talk to his friends in this, this simulated world. And to get, and he just couldn't make any contact, right? You couldn't have a conversation with him. He couldn't tolerate the contact. So we finally, we finally, what we ended up doing was I had the father um, turn off the power on the back of the house where the room was and say it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it was the electric company, right? Or something like that. And so it forced the whole family into the living room. They had to live in the living room. And so we just, we sat there for like two weeks where everybody had to actually confront each other. They actually had to, had to tolerate the anxiety of actually coming into contact with one another and struggling with this, right? Um, right. And I thought to myself that, that I'm like, this is, this is the future. Well, it's actually the present, yeah. um, but this is it's the, the present, this is yeah. future, very, very literally. I would love to hear more about circling a bit later, yeah. if you wish. Oh yeah, totally. I, I want to, um, I want to embed this in, um, in a social context, mm -hmm. uh, yep. because we we're discussing the individual, yeah. like from the individual to so society. Yeah. Now we can have a look at society to the individual. Um, and then I, I really, really want to learn more about circling, if you don't mind. Yeah, so, you bet. Uh, it's fascinating. So. Yeah, I went online and everything, but it's very difficult to tell exactly like with narcissism. It's very difficult to tell what to trust and what not to trust. There's so, right. so much right. about it. Right. Um, just a comment about about the social social a social way of, of seeing this. Yeah. First of all, cyberspace mm -hmm. is the first case in human history right. where you can inhabit the afterlife. Right. Christianity told you, this world is a corridor. Mm -hmm. You must behave in certain ways. You must buy indulgences. Yeah. You must be good to your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, depending on how she looks, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And then you accumulate credits, but you can't use the credits here. You know, mm -hmm. you can use them only upstairs. So everything was... A preface, an introduction to. Yeah. Same with the Platonic ideals. Plato never pretended that ideals um, are accessible. He pretended that they exist. Yeah. He said that they have existence. Yeah. But he never said that they're accessible. Yeah. He said they're accessible only through instances. Yeah. Like there's the ideal, and then you have an instance of this ideal of triangle, and then you have the triangles that you come across in life. Yeah. So, but you never, of course, access the ideal. Right. So all these systems of thought denied us access. They were based on denial of access and gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. They were gatekeepers and they did not let us access yeah. the kingdom of heaven yeah. or heaven yeah. or the cave. Right. No access. Right. Cyberspace is the first utopia where we are granted full access. It's the first kingdom of heaven that is on earth it's the first paradise that is open to one and sundry it's the first reification of the platonic ideals that is open to everyone it's disneyland mm. it's disneyland of the afterlife it is the afterlife mm. we're in heaven we just don't realize it yeah yet okay throughout this throughout this um process of promising and denying, denying and promising, it's called in psychology, approach, avoidance, repetition, compulsion. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I promise you the kingdom of heaven, but you know what, not yet. I promise you paradise, but not yet. You have to do some things. I, I promise no, yes, no, yes, no. 
intermittent reinforcement. It's a form of bullying. All these thought systems, they were bullying us. So there was, of course, rebellion. People rebelled against this. They rebelled against the constant promising and not delivering. They rebelled against the inaccessibility of paradise, Garden of Eden. They rebelled against um, the intractability, intract, intractable abstract nature of the Platonic ideals. There was a rebellion against Plato, big one, especially yeah. in the 19th century. Yeah. So there was rebellion. And two major forms of rebellion were nihilism and narcissism. Right. Nihilism was always a form of dissent. Mm. In the medieval ages, the word nihilism meant heresy. Mm -hmm. They used the word nihilism to yeah. describe heresy. Oh, interesting. Buddha, yeah. Buddha used the Hindu word for nihilism to describe disbelief in reincarnation. Right. So nihilism in Russia is called skepticism. Huh. That's nihilism. Right. Ironically, because Russia is the hotbed of nihilism. So yeah. nihilism was always identified historically with dissent. It was a dissenting view. Mm. Same with Nazism. They were, these were two rebellions. Now, we live in the age of Spartacus. Mm. We live in an age of a rebellion of the slaves against their masters. Mm. Nietzsche. Yeah. Yes. Slave yeah. mentality. Yeah. So the, what the internet has done, right. it created something that I call malignant egalitarianism. Malignant egalitarianism is when the slave counterfactually considers herself a master right. or equal to the master right. or possessed of the same qualities and advantages of the master. Yeah. This is malignant egalitarianism because it's counterfactual. Yeah. And this malignant egalitarianism creates ressentiment, malignant envy. Yeah, yeah. Ressentiment, because the slaves are inferior. Right. They are inferior. It's right. politically incorrect to say this. Right. But they are inferior. Yeah. And, but they use technology and they use democracy as tools of ressentiment. Yeah. It's a, as tools of rebellion. Yeah. They rebel yeah. against the elites of masters, the masterful elites using democracy and using technology. Mm. And they create something which I call malignant egalitarianism. Right. Now, that is very gratifying. Yeah. You remember what I said that um, it cannot offer you love, but it can offer you fantasy. Yeah. The yeah. fantasy of malignant egalitarianism is irresistible because it makes it renders you a master. Huh. member of the master right or in the case of nazism the master race you know master you become a master right and the internet makes you a master makes you a master because you it puts you on par with the elites with the masters right that's why people reject expertise people reject expertise they reject authority yeah. they hate erudition and knowledge right there's a huge fundamental hatred and resentment right. of any superiority or implied superiority, right. even acquired superiority, superiority that you work very hard to acquire, yeah. like learning, like yeah. learning, like knowledge. Right. Even that is resented right. because it's malignant egalitarianism and mm. ressentiment. Mm. And the internet allows you to participate in the fantasy that you had come, you had arrived. Yeah. You are equal to the elites. Right. Now, the irony is Technology and democracy were invented by the elites as illusions. The elites created technology and democracy to give the masses of slaves the illusion that they are not slaves. Right. So right. technology and democracy were based on uh, simulacra, spectacle, reification, fetishism, right. uh, fantasy. Right. The idea was that democracy and technology will be the equivalent of drugs, sedatives in a way, and you will consume them. And when you consume them, you will forget that you are a slave. Right. You will forget that you're a slave, so you will not have an incentive to rebel. Right. This was anti-rebellion measures. Right. 
if you read if you read the deliberations of the founding fathers mm -hmm. of the united states of america mm -hmm. allegedly and ostensibly the greatest democracy on earth yeah you will see how anti-democratic they were yeah they had profound anti-democratic instincts yeah they detested the mob they were terrified of people power that's why you have an electoral college and not popular vote right apropos the elections right you have this because the founding fathers held average common pedestrian people in absolute sheer contempt and terror huh. so the people who invented democracy yeah. they had profound anti-democratic instincts and they created anti-democratic institutions yeah and the people who invented technology they were elitists mm. to this very day silicon valley is elitist oh yeah or at least they consider themselves superior in numerous ways right and so and the irony is that the masses absconded with these devices mm -hmm. and transformed them into tools of empowerment right we lost control as elites the elites lost control over these stratagems and now the masses are abusing democracy and abusing technology yeah. to subdue the masters who had invented technology and in other words the masses are rebelling through the tools given to them the slaves are rebelling mm -hmm. through the tools given to them by the masters in order to ensure that they don't rebel right. it's a very ironical twist of history and wow. of course this is extreme overtones of religion generally narcissism in my view is a form of religion but we can discuss it yeah maybe some other time or yeah. later wow anyhow that's how i see it from this from society's point of view it's a slave rebellion yeah and slaves naturally naturally slaves adopted the two major movements of dissent in human history narcissism yeah. and nihilism yeah so the masses the slaves in this age of spartacus mm -hmm. these slaves had adopted nihilism and narcissism because historically these were the two major movements of dissent mm -hmm. and and this is of course jordan peterson's message right. that nihilism is bad for you yeah and you should go back yeah. to being a slave right i'm sorry but that's precisely what he said he says nihilism is bad for you rebellion is bad for you yeah. you should go back to being a slave that's also the message of other others like like uh, robert green okay. in his books robert green openly says in his books you should not rebel you should not disagree you should fit in you should pretend you should fake you should play the game yeah yeah you know these are conformist right. thinkers reactionary thinkers who want to put the genie back in the bottle yeah the genie is out <laughs> and they want to put it back in the bottle right That's, of course bottle is broken right it's really interesting because the thing it's really true it's like if you think about with the internet like it's so yeah you're right it's like it's it's to have access to it basically you don't have to earn it right basically you can get on facebook and you can just immediately you have like visibility and all those kinds of things. So it's not, it's not actually earned. So all of a sudden we're in a, in a situation where anybody could say anything at any point, basically. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think it's actually, you know, this, this, this thing that you talked about, um, you know, the two choices that we have right now, either like choose the, choose society, right. Or choose, choose the uh, uh the world or choose the self right but e yes or, or choose self or other the technical yeah. term is other yeah like cho choose either self or other yes right or, right so circling you asked about a little bit about circling um yes i'm very curious to hear about from yeah the, from I, the source. my sense my sense about my sense is is it's essentially circling is actually a response to this right to social media um mm -hmm. and it took me a while to kind of figure that out but i think it's because there is so you know with, with i i place it with the answering machine right was the 
was the first time where uh, basically to exchange any infor information, you would always have to have a conversation. At least you'd have to talk on the phone, right? So the answering machine was probably the first time where you could, you could, you could do that, basically fulfill that function without having to deal with right, the, all the ambiguity that comes up with social interactions. And now that's multiplied, right? You know, a billion times to where, because you know, our nervous systems are designed to, to, to move towards the, the, the easier thing and not and away from the harder thing. And so we've never had this choice before um, to, to such a degree where, where basically I can, in so many ways, if you think about it, it's like I can, all I need is an internet connection and I can have a career. I could become famous. I could have billions of friends, right? I could, I can invent things. <laughs> and I literally don't ever have to come into any kind of contact with any, anybody else, right? As this is all what you were just uh, were pointing out. So I think what, what's happened is similar to um, what happened in the industrial revolution, uh, um, the, the industrial revolution with, in terms of our body, where machines had to right, reduced, reduce the world down to a small, a small circle in front of us so we didn't have to move anymore. And so all of a sudden we, like, we started to have this new distinction called physical fitness. And it became a domain of concern that we actually had to do, we had to, uh, um, you know, in, in thus gyms, right? Where you go and you have to, you know, concentrate gravity and you pay money to go and move, which is so bizarre when you really think about it. It's like uncannily weird. Um, I think the same thing is happening with, with, with relationships with the internet is that we're, we're starting to now see where it life no longer demands implicitly um, conversation, interaction, right? Face to face. And I, and I don't even mean any, like necessarily anything super authentic. I just mean the basic coordination and normativity that happens in like a dialogue, right? The normal, the normal mm -hmm. thing, right? And you think about all the anxiety one has to encounter to to be with another person like you could say something to me that could reveal something about me that's true that i didn't know that could enlighten me that could destroy my life could d destroy my self-esteem right like so much as you know the moment you and i face each other and you start making you start making noises out of your mouth somehow like there's an enormous amount that happens with that. So it's like encountering anxiety and moving through it and coming into contact and, and all of the normativity that comes through that, right? And the regulation. And so I think what's happened is, is basically we've eliminated most of that. And you're right, this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a strange, it's a strange form of deliberate narcissism basically. Right, where like I actually do, I outsource my identity, right? And I, there's this gap of time between, right? Like stimulus and response. Yeah, it's so strange. So I think what's, what's ended up happening because we become through and in through relationship, right? That's a, it's having, it's like having a, like a, a, a huge profound like impact on how deeply we're suffering. And so circling basically is, um, it's, a, it's a yoga that isolates interpersonal connection. That's basically what it is. It's like, it's, you know, from, from the outside looking, looking in, you could say that it looks like most any other kind of um, human potential movement group kind of thing. But it's, it's actually the context of it, I think is really, really different. And, and why I think it's different is, is basically the, the, the context of it is not, is not psychological. It's not, psych, it's not overtly trying to improve yourself or, or like work through an issue or something like that. It is right. simply like identifying 
what are the what are the fundamental asanas, if you will, right, that are in play when you have profound interactions and deep moments of intimacy, right, in relationship. And if you imagine going, okay, what are the essence of those things? What's like, what posture do you, do you stand with your communication, with your listening, right? With your awareness, all of these kinds of things. And then you just get together in a group and you just assume those postures and you just work the muscle of staying, basically staying in contact, right? And doing the things and like communicating and listening in such a way that move towards revealing what only things like intimacy can reveal, right? Which I think is a, <clears throat> and why I think it's, it's, it's really different. And this is the connection for Heidegger for me was, is, and I didn't realize this until years later, right? Um, why I was so interested in Heidegger while we started circling, <laughs> right? But I'm, as, as times unfolded, I'm starting to go, oh, okay, this is why, okay, this is why I was like reading Being in Time in my early 20s, like while I was in art school, right? Um, oh, you? <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and then I go in circle. Uh, but it has to do with this, the, the sense of, you could say the way that Heidegger talks about aletheia, right? The sense of truth as the, uh, the event of unconcealment and concealment. And this, I think what happens in relationship is truth is the kind of truth, right? When it's authentic, right? Is it has to do with um, being attracted to and cultivating the, the the sense of of concealment of of that of that being with what is and that's the purpose of, of circling in a nutshell is it's it's the it's the practice of um we're practicing profoundly being with that which is right so it has to do with like what's emerging right paying attention to what's emerging more kind of bottom up right and sensing and sensing concealment and moving towards concealment in the way that we're being with it, right? And we're being with each other. Um, yeah, so that's basically what circling is. Is it? It's a gym. You could say it's like a. It's a practice. It's a gym that 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 basically takes what what the internet has removed from necessity, and it's. It just brought it into a way of, of doing the yoga that exercises, as, as John Vervecki would say, like the, the machinery of transcendence, the machinery of, uh, of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like interpersonal aerobics. Yeah, absolutely. Aerobics. Yeah. Interpersonal aerobics. Yeah. Yeah, restoring the muscles. Yeah, these muscles are atrophied. I agree. Mm -hmm. You you raised the f you raised several uh, fascinating questions. I should have let you talk much more. <laughs> I'm sorry that I hoped hoped some no, of this. We could. I, I'd love to talk more. I have I this tendency. Cut me off. I mean, feel free. I mean, don't yeah, don't yeah. let me take over. Yeah. Uh, but you raised raised a few fascinating questions. I'll, I'll try this time to be a lot more concise. You said when we are on the internet, there's no real connection. There's no real contact. It's uh, it's delayed. There's time delay between stimulus and, and response and yeah. it's it tallies exactly with what i said mm. there is no reaction there is no real contact or interaction or interface yeah and time is irrelevant yeah because there's nobody there yeah there's no self yeah you have to choose self or world right and when you're on the internet yeah as a life choice you had chosen the world you had chosen to abrogate yourself. Yeah. The people who are online, I mean, on a permanent basis, this is their main mode of being in the world. Right. They don't have a self. Right. And in this sense, they are narcissists. Narcissists don't have an ego or a self. They import, they outsource the functions that are usually that usually comprise the self. Yeah. They outsource these functions from the outside, from other people. Yeah. But they don't have a self. Yeah. They have imported, constantly reconstituted and reassembled selves, numerous selves, by the way, 
which yeah. is why they feel discontinuous and dissociative. Yeah. So there's no self there. And of course, consequently, there's no contact. There's no interaction. There's no nothing. There's no self. Second thing you, you said, you mentioned the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution was the, the major turning point in, in human psychology. Um, and the internet is the second major turning point. Right. Not, the, not agriculture, by the way. Agriculture was the major turning point as far as gender relations. Yeah. But there was no major change in psychology. Yeah. Urbanization started some, some irreversible changes. But industrial revolution was an external shock. Why? Because in the industrial revolution, you became one with a machine. Yeah. It was the first time that we had created cyborgs. Yeah. Cyborgs, right. which is one half machine, one half human. Right. Inseparable, mm. integral, mm -hmm. a chimera yeah. of machine men, yeah. machine human. Yeah. It was the first time. And of course, the internet is a natural extension of this. We used to we used to merge with machine tools in the factory. Yeah. But now we merge with our smartphones. Right. There's no no difference in principle. Right. It's a continuation of the industrial revolution by other means right. and with other instruments mm -hmm. and with other devices. Mm -hmm. But the principle had been established in the industrial revolution. Yeah. Humans have value, humans have worth only when they merge with a machine. If they refuse to merge with a machine, if they choose the self, then they are shunned, ostracized, excommunicated, isolated, or in the immortal words of Donald Trump, they're fired. Yeah, yeah. So you had a choice. The Industrial Revolution posi pos posited a choice, gave you a choice. Mm -hmm. You want to remain an individual? You want to have a self? Wonderful, but you can't be part of society. Sorry, you want to belong to society? You must become, you must merge with a machine. And we will tell you which machine. Yeah. You must merge with a machine. You must create a symbiosis. Yeah. It's the same today. You right. want to be an individual? You want to have a self? You want, no problem. But we will not talk to you. Yeah. We will not love you. Yeah. We will not interact with you. We will not do business with you. Yeah. You will be shunned, ostracized, and communicated. You will die alone. Yeah. You want to be part of us, one of us? Yeah. You must abrogate, suspend your individuality, yourself. Yeah. You must merge with a machine. And this machine happens to be a laptop or a smartphone, but you must merge with the machine. Yeah. It is through the machine that you will acquire worth. Yeah. Value. Yeah. Your humanity, your humanness. Heidegger would have hated it because, you know, but your humanness, your humanity had become secondary to a derivative of technology. So there is isn't framing and framing on two fronts, on two levels. Yeah. Technology and frames. Technology yeah. puts you in the reserve. Yeah. Technology regards you yeah. as a production unit. Yeah. Uh, or what Marx would have called means of production. Yeah. So technology and frames you but people and frame you too. Mm -hmm. We have come to a mm -hmm. very sick pathological situation yeah. where if you want to have any contact with another human being, yeah. you must be enframed right. by all other human beings. Right. In the past, only technology enframed you. Yeah. So when you went to the factory to work 14 hours yeah. a day, yeah. you were enframed by, yeah. by technology. Yeah. But after you left the factory, your interactions with other people mm -hmm. were real, yeah. authentic. Right. You went to church, you had a family and so on. Right. Today, you don't have this, this luxury. Yeah. You are totally inframed. Right. You are inframed by technology. Yeah. And when you use technology, you are inframed by, by your interlocutors, by people. Yeah. What is to monetize eyeballs? That's not inframing. Right. Right. That's in framing. That's totally that's framing. Make, yeah. That's making you part of the reserve. Yeah. But it's it's not technological reserve. It's a social reserve. Right. We have two layers of reserve today. Heidegger would have been shocked 
Right. He, he thought the technological and framing is a problem. Now imagine there's no escape. Wherever you go, you're in frame. Yeah. Wherever you go, you're a unit. You're commoditized. You're commoditized. Yes. You're commodified. Right. You're a grain of, of rice. And so to reacquire individuality, they tell you, okay, if you want to reacquire individuality, we will provide you with a fantasy. That's the fantasy of narcissism. You can be in this fantasy, you can be grandiose, you can be special, you can be amazing, you can be unprecedented. But of course it's a fantasy. Right. It's a it's a compensatory because technology and society are commodifying you, commoditizing you. Hmm. It's a horrible, horrible state of things yeah that we had come to this dilemma equipotent dilemma if in today's world if i want to be an individual i will be severely punished to the point of an annihilation yeah simple yeah annihilation not alienation not reification not forget all this yeah this was child's play yeah today they will annihilate you yeah if you insist to be individual they will annihilate you right you want to play with us you want to talk to us you want us to love you you want intimacy whatever you want you must be enframed right you must become an eyeball right. you must become a statistic you must, and we will provide you the means yeah. to compensate yourself for this commodity commodification yeah and that is narcissism so compared right. to sort of thing. one thing i i when i was listening to to circling, mm -hmm. I failed. I failed to understand in which sense circling is not outsourcing critical self functions. Mm -hmm. Because I understood that in circling, you're sitting in a circle mm -hmm. with a group of people. Yeah, and then you're using these people to acquire intimacy. Uh, you're. I mean, in which sense is this not outsourcing? Right. In right. which sense? Right. I mean, how is it different to the internet except the fact that yeah. you have body language and vibes and you know, face well, to face? It, it, this is the, this is the thing. Um, this is what I think uh, is what I've been able to observe is it's similar. It's similar to the way um, uh, it, it. It's not. You're not going to circling for for those relationships, right? It's more, it's a context, just like when you meditate, right? So like you're meditating to exercise, um, uh, staying in awareness and, you know, non-discursive awareness, that, that kind of thing, such that when you're walking around and you're not thinking about meditating, you're just more present, right? Things, your, your senses are more open. It's just basically, if you just take that same principle and apply it to circling, it's it's basically the same thing. Oh, now it's an like, environment. Yeah, yeah. If the it's an if, environment. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And it, so it's explicitly, and this is. I mean, it's new. I don't think anything's. I don't think anything's been been exactly like that because it hasn't been necessary. Because life used to, <laughs> right, have enough interaction. Right to to not to not warrant like not need not need to warrant a practice, but now there's I think we're at a place where it seems to be that people actually need to just like they need to go to a gym to move, right? People need to go to a gym, right, to be able to to um, not get intimacy there, right, but exercise the right like, right how the to get intimacy as well of that right. And that's not to say that people don't like, you know, get led astray and they kind of look for the intimacy there and all that kind of stuff. But the intent, like the intention of it is, um, is to essentially is to dwell, to dwell in, I would say the sweet spot in between what you're talking about of, of that place where, um, you know, cause there's that sense of intimacy. I like the way that the uh, systems um, family systems talks about it. I think it's family systems where they talk about intimacy as a function of your ability to tolerate anxiety, right? So, so it's like, and they, and they would say that it, it derives from the two fundamental drives, right? Is like on one level, we want to like, we want to merge with our environment and have absolute security and total belonging. And, and at the same time, we also want to 
like we want to stand out in our cosmic significance and specialness, right? And so it, moments of intimacy usually are those moments where um, in order to be myself, I may have to say something that like that sacrifices my my belonging or threaten my belonging, right? Um, and vice versa. So in some sense, it's 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 isolating that phenomena of like, all right, if I'm practicing here, like, okay, so, you know, if I can tolerate the anxiety, if I can move, if I can confront it and be with it in the face mm -hmm. of, right, of that, then there's, there's something transforming about that. Like there's, some, there's like a liberation that happens about that. That's, if you look at just the way that, like what we've been talking about this in this whole conversation, if you just look at the life as it is, as it's structured, doesn't provide very many of those opportunities. And I would say the, you're right. It's like even all the way into the family, right? Even like all the way into all that's, I think that's one of the brilliances. I think it's like Heidegger's, you know, his, where his brilliance shines through is he's, he's like, yeah, tech technology isn't, it isn't a, it isn't a tool, <laughs> right? It's, it's become, it's become our, it's become our understanding of that which is, right? And it's essentially we do now pre-reflectively without even noticing it, right? See any, anything that is and isn't as a resource, right? Uh, as, to, as a way to optimize it, right? And, and exploit it and, and, and consume it but this this sense of being with something that doesn't 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 uh, just give you you know doesn't make itself immediately intelligible, right? This kind of sense of dwelling in a place, right, and sensing that there's some meaning that I don't quite understand, right? And taught like. And, and being with paradox, right? And all those moments of that, 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 that kind of truth of, of Aletheia, it's, it's a shrinking, shrinking, shrinking exponentially, right? So that's the thing that I, I really think that circling is, is doing, right? Is it's about holding open right that space, right? Where, you know, Heidegger would say it's like it's, hold, it's holding open and in this sense, this is why I think it's philosophy, right? This is why I don't think it's psychology, like at, in, in terms of the context. I don't of think there's a distinction, by the way. <laughs> With that? I don't With think that? there's a distinction, by the way. Yeah. You don't think there's a distinction? Between philosophy and psychology? No. Oh, okay. And by the way, in the majority of countries in the world, yeah. there is no separate psychology department. It's part of the philosophy department. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. For example, in Russia, the psychology faculty is part of the philosophy department. Right, right. Great teacher. Right, totally. So it's like, like I think what we're kind of, what we're doing right now, right, is we're wrestling with something, right? We're <laughs> like, there's a sense of something and we're, we're taught, we're, we're, we're exchanging things and I'm going to be thinking about this for the next, for the next, you know, probably year or so. <laughs> You're right that this is a lost, lost art. There is intolerance of ambiguity, intolerance yeah. of uncertainty, yeah. intolerance of lack of immediate rewards. I mean, right. there's no ability to delay gratification. Right. There is surrender to impulses, impulsivity. There is, I mean, too many things, too many things advocate against prolonged, profound, deep yeah. interactions. Right. People want immediate benefits, 30 second sound bites and so on. It's well known, no yeah. need to repeat it. But it's reflexive of, it reflects the, the choice of the other. Because if you don't exist, and if you are constantly constellated by the gaze of other people, yeah. so you need like people to see you for you to feel that you exist. Yeah. And if they don't see you, 
you don't exist. It's not if they don't see you, you feel that you don't exist. If they don't see you, then you don't exist. Yeah. yeah. So this inter intersection of gazes in the center of this Venn diagram, you know, in intersection of gazes, this center is you. That's you. That's yourself. In 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 the choice, in the choice, in the narcissistic choice. So if this if this is the case, patience, tolerance of ambiguity, tolerance of of uh, ambivalence, of equivocation, of uncertainty, lack of clarity. These kind of tolerances, they require a very strong core. Yeah. They require self-trust and self-confidence. Right. They require, and if you don't have a self, yeah. of course you will be intolerant. Yeah. Intolerance is the direct outcome of a lack of self. Yeah. That's why we see it rising. Yeah. You know? yeah. We have given up on the self. Right. This is the irony. People think that to be narcissist, a narcissist is to be selfish. No, the narcissist does not have a self. Right. He does not have an ego. Right. He is a parasite right. in a symbiosis with other people. Yeah. He consumes their input in order to constantly constellate and construct a self yeah. and an ego, which is yeah. a kaleidoscope and changes every second. Right. So we have we we definitely have settled on this solution i mean the, the, if there was any question 50 years ago there's no question today in my mind yeah that we had settled yeah. for the narcissistic solution right and we had adopted our technologies to cater to this solution and we had adopted our social institutions our politics yeah. our show business yeah. our messaging yeah. our skills, our education system they're all geared right now to cater to a sacrifice of the self, like giving up the self. Hmm. We give up the principle of individuation. By the way, we give it up physically. Like yeah. for the first time, majority of people under the age of 35 live with their parents. Hmm. They don't separate and individuate. Yeah. They don't have their own personal space, yep. their own family, yep. their own intimate relationships. They live with mommy and daddy. Yep. It's it's not anymore an abstraction yeah. in the mind of some deranged psychologist. It's it's reality. Yeah. We don't separate. We don't. We gave up the self. Yeah. It's not an individualistic age. Right. It's not. Right. It's ochlocracy. It's a mob age. Mm. It's the age of the mob. Yep. And long, long before me, Jose Ortega y Gasset said it in his Revolt of the Masses. Mm. You know. Mm -hmm. in 1932 right. he said it 190 years ago he yeah. warned against this yeah he said we are not going in the direction of more and more growing individualism no way yeah we are going in the direction of growing mobs which will subsume the individual yep. and eliminate him yep yeah the internet is technological mob rule right let's go on any forum yeah it's technological mob rule right and it is a reification of the principle of give up yourself so that we will love you yeah you want to belong you want to be loved you have to give up yourself right. Right. you want to be hated right you want to be despised you want to be ostracized you want to pay with your with your living and with your life yeah stand out be a self yeah. we will allow you to stand out but only within a fantasy space not in reality so that you don't really challenge us so that we can say it's a fantasy it's grandiose right. you know we can yeah because if you really stand out if you really have independent individual value if you really are special really really if you are a real genius if you are real, we feel threatened yeah. it undermines the whole the whole project yeah so we're going to mow you down right we're going to mow you down huh. now most geniuses have been rejected throughout human history yep and suffered throughout human history yeah but they didn't suffer and they were not rejected because they threatened because they threatened the the social order in the sense that they threaten the role of the individual mm -hmm. in of the single person in society that's not what they were moved on right but today people who are really really special people who who choose who choose self people who choose individuality mm -hmm. they are being decimated because they threaten the role of the individual within the collective it's it's um it's like you must disappear 
Yeah. You must vanish. The, the principle that rules human life today is the principle of absence. Yeah. Maybe that's the biggest revolution in human affairs because until I would say, I don't know, 1940s, 50s, yeah. the, the principle that ruled human life was the principle of presence. Yeah. You needed a presence of mind, you needed a presence of body. Right. You were present in life. Yeah. You were present in life. Even Heidegger yeah. said that. Heidegger yeah. didn't didn't say that you were not present in life. Yeah. You were present in life. Yeah. The principle that rules today's world, in order to experience anything, anything, you must choose absence. You must choose to not be. This is the trade-off. Right. Right. To be or not to be, to not be. Right. Right. And ironically, that's narcissism. That's what people don't understand. The narcissism, you know, narcissist disappears. Yeah. The narcissist is an absence. He's a receptacle. Yeah. But he's not the water. He's not the wine. Yeah. He's not the religious wine. He's just a receptacle. Right. The wine is other people. Yeah. So narcissist's fundamental principle of action, yeah. mode of operation, is to deny himself. It's to not be. Yeah. To not be. Right. And of course, oh. the only the only other entity which does not exist and has no being is God. It's the only other entity. So we are all now by denying our existence and our we are all becoming godlike. Yeah. Totally. We are atemporal. We have no time anymore. Right. Atemporal. Right. We have no memory. We have no memory. Right. We have no history. We are ahistorical. Yeah. We live in the present in the bad sense of the word, not in the good sense. Huh. We live in the presence not on the way to an unfurling future potential. So we don't feed off the past. Or, yeah. No, we live in the present because we have no past. Yeah. And we have no future. Right. We have given up on the past and the future because we have no self. The self is an organizing and explanatory principle. It puts together yep. the past, the present, and the future. It is Heidegger's temporality. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And and to have given this up is to have given up on time. We gave up on time. Right. Well, well. And of course, it's a hopeless situation because what is hope? Yeah. Hope is an extrapolation from the past to the future via the present and via your agency. Right. If you don't exist, there's no hope. Can right. never be hope. Right. You can make a million dollars tomorrow. It yeah. will not bring you an ounce of hope. Yeah. Because to experience hope and love and many other things, but especially hope. You need to have a temporal perspective. You need to be a being, oh, a yeah. being in time. Right. Totally. Sight on sign. Right. You need to you need to have both. Right. If you have don't have sign, yep. you don't have sight. Right. You don't have sight, you don't have hope. Yeah. It's a hopeless world. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't hear. Yeah, you you can't hear the kind of possibilities right that that one listens to right when they're not reifying <laughs> right there's that sense of like you know because that's isn't that the paradox wouldn't you say is is that when you go inside uh, let's say you go inside and you say okay i'm not gonna like i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna be with with self versus the world or, or other and then the first thing that you realize is that you're sitting there and you're just re you notice that your mind is, is doing it for you where it's just like throwing up things and in situations to to i always kind of i always thought it always occurred to me is is that 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 kind of default network thing that keep, keeps going on and on and on is essentially doing the same thing isn't it it's like it's like it, we need to know that we exist so it's it's continually kind of slapping us letting us know that we're here but then there's, there's that quality between... where where like in for example in meditation or something like that where you you know you kind of be with that and then at some point it it starts to dissolve a bit and then you're you paradoxically 
that you know the 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 op the openness right basically the openness that allows the world to occur as the world right um paradoxically it just it, it's not well it's not a self-image i think is probably the word right like, i think, I think you're struggling thing. with you're struggling with um with a very basic problem in in psychology mm -hmm. we often confuse uh, constellation or essence or whatever you want to call it with function yep we we have this perception Sartre wrote about it in the 40s in the yeah. no even in the 20s and 30s Sartre wrote about it that when we don't have a purpose when we don't have a function we are confused we are discombobulated yeah. we need to interpret everything in terms of function and purpose yeah listen. So when you're alone with yourself, of course you hear other people's voices. Mm. It's called introjects. Yeah. Of course you have memories that involve numerous other people and interactions. Yep. And you have regrets. Yep. You have regrets. And you have, you have memories that put a smile on your face. I mean, people operate inside your head all the time. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. Yeah. But they don't fulfill any function. It's not a function, it's who you are. Yeah, yeah. Narcissism is relegating and delegating yeah. all your functionality to other people. Yeah. Well, when you take out all the functionality and give it to other people, hmm. there is no agent because agency is defined via action. There's no agent without action. If you are inert, utterly inactive because others do everything for you internally right you derive all the functions from outside right then you have no agency there's no agent yeah by the way there's no moral agent as well there's no morality yeah of course there's no empathy right because you need an agent to empathize empathy is a function right so okay so that's a distinction between who you are your identity, your yeah. essence, your quiddity, your depending on which discipline you come from, and functioning. Yeah. All functioning today is outsourced. Yeah. So consequently, we are all dead inside. Yeah. We all have dead objects. Mm -hmm. Objects that don't function are dead. They're dead objects inside here. There's a lodestone, dead, mm. as dead as a stone. Mm. And we all all life comes to us from outside. Yeah. Now. the process of becoming the world happens to you yeah. the world happens to your being but there must be someone there to accept the world right to accept the potentialities of the world yep, yep. there must be someone there to become yep. to engage in the process of becoming yeah if whatever is in there is dead because all the functions are thrown out yep. outsourced yep offshored right so what's left there is a dead body, a corpse. Yep. We are all, we live in a thanatic civilization, civilization that we live in a death cult. Yeah. We, yeah. Our civilization is a death cult. Right. By the way, I blame, I blame Heidegger a lot for this. Uh -huh. Our civilization is a death cult. Mm -hmm. We celebrate death. Mm -hmm. We celebrate inanimate objects mm -hmm. and we prefer the inanimate to the animate. Yeah. We prefer objects to people. We kill people yeah. because they destroyed objects. Yeah. And so it's a death cult. Mm -hmm. And we, because we gave all our functions to other people, inside we have dead objects. Right. And this is what allows us to function inside this death cult, right. to function in this civilization that worships the dead and worships dead objects, yeah. worships the inanimate worships material objects yep. prefers them to human beings yep. you objectifies human beings yep. uses regards them as objects yeah. interpolates them considers them as reserve and frames them yep. this kind of civilization you have a relative advantage an evolutionary advantage if you're also dead if you're alive in such a civilization right. you are ill adapted it's a maladaptation yeah in a civilization that celebrates death you need to be dead to succeed. 
Right. You need to be dead to survive. Right. So we all commit suicide by relegating and delegating our internal functions to other people. And so consequently, we become hopeless because we can never become, the process of becoming will never happen. The world will never happen to us. Right. The world in all its magnificent, plethora, spectacular, peacock tail of potentialities and possibilities right. will never happen to us. Right. Why? We are not there. There's nobody home. The world comes knocking. The sign is supposed to unfurl, you know, uh, reveal itself somehow, but there's nobody there. Yeah. The world comes knocking, 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 goes away. There's yeah. nobody there. Yeah. What do we do instead? Yeah. We shoot ourselves, we shoot ourselves, the self, we shoot it in the head, we kill it. Yeah. And then we ask other people, excuse me, yesterday I killed myself. I killed myself, not myself, not my body, but I killed my mind. I killed myself. Would you mind helping me? Would you mind doing this function for me, that function for me, this function for me? This? So you talk to 20 people, put together, they are your self. You, we have external self, like external memory in a computer. Yeah. We, we all have now external selves, yeah. while before that we used to have internal selves. Yeah. Right. And it's dead. Right. It's dead. We live in a graveyard. Right. Our civilization is a gigantic cemetery. Yeah. Cemetery. Totally. And we are all zombies and golems, huh. you know? And we think if we put the word of God, the name of God in the golem's mouth, it will come alive. Or if we find the right doctor by the name of Frankenstein, we will come alive. So we keep looking for God, for Frankenstein. These are the gurus and the coaches and the these are the Frankensteins. Yeah. And we keep looking for we, we keep we are desperate. Yeah. This is not angst. Angst is a, a bloody yeah. understatement. Yeah. This is existential profundity. This yeah. is the depth of the abyss. Yep. And the abyss yep. is not looking back at us. Uh, it had yeah. devoured us. Yeah. It had devoured us. Right. We don't realize this. Totally. And we live in the abyss. That's the uncanny thing, isn't it? It's that. I mean, the un un uncanny t part is that it's like a dark, was it a dark time is not, a dark time is, isn't, isn't people walking around talking about how dark it is. A dark time is no one's walking around talking about how dark it is, right? That's the uncanniness of it. Yes. This is Very why nice. I just think this is really important. Like this, like uh, my, my sense is the conversation about tech, not about technological objects, but about technology as such, right? Which is, as you're talking about, is synonymous with the world as such at this point, right? And in the corollary, like loss of presence and the loss of, and, and, and not even noticing the loss and the rise of narcissism as, as a necessity for that to function, I think is probably the most important, it's gotta be the most important conversation happening right now. Um, in terms of seeing, we're never going to discuss technology seriously. What's that? We're never going to discuss technology seriously. Are you kidding me? Yeah. This is the most subversive imaginable act. The yeah. punishment is horrendous. Yeah, you have. You, we discuss artifacts of technology. Yeah, we discuss specific functions of technology. Yeah, we discuss social impacts of technology, psychological impacts, but we never discuss technology. Yeah, because if you were to discuss technology you would have realized that 300 years ago, technology subsumed us, digested us, and spat us out. Mm -hmm. 300 years ago, we were forced to merge with the machine. Yeah. And the machine is stronger, more robust, yeah. now much more intelligent than us. Yeah. This merger was not on equal terms. Mm -hmm. Even in the Industrial Revolution, the factory workers were slaves. Yep. The machines were the masters. Yep. The machines represented the masters. Marx said it. Marx and Engels said that the means of production determine. They are the determinants of history. Yep. You know, so the machines. Do you know what 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 how we call machines in uh, one of my heads is an economic advisor. Do you know how we call machines in economics? 
We call them capital investment. Yeah. And how do we call people? Human capital. Yep. yep. Do you know what psychology, how psychology calls people? Do you know what's the clinical term for people in psychology? We don't say people. We don't say persons. You will not find it in any textbook. Mm -hmm. What do we call people? Get guess. Objects. Yeah. In yep. psychology, we use the word objects yep. to relate to people. So, yep. for example, mother, mm -hmm. mother in psychology, you never see the word mother. That's blasphemy. Mother in psychology, we call it primary object. Primary object, yeah. <laughs> right. This is very telling. Right. As numerous mm -hmm. philosophers, numerous philosophers told us, not the least of, of which was Wittgenstein. Yeah. Language reveals a lot. These are not accidental choices, not incidental choices. Yeah. We have chosen death. We have chosen objects. Right. And to fit in, to adapt, to survive, to thrive. We understood that we have to die. Right. That's a, that's a precondition. Right. We have to die. Right. And now we died, but we still need to function somehow. Yeah. So what we do, we have a group of people around us and they fulfill the functions that we gave up internally. Mm -hmm. And so we walk around, you know, three funerals and a wedding. <laughs> this is awesome. I have to, I have to go. I have somebody, somebody at 830 sure. I have to, I have to, for an appointment. This has been really extraordinary. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Yeah. I apologize that I took so much of the conversation. No, this is why, I, this is why I contacted you about this. Uh, what I'd like to do, if you're open to it, is I'd like to just, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put this on the channel. You're welcome to put it on your channel too, if you want the, the uh, but I'd love to, to, I'd love to go back and just watch this. Cause you, you opened up some things that were quite deep um, that I want to, I want to grok a little bit more, um, engage with more of myself and then have a, have another conversation where we can talk, where we can talk more about it once My I get pleasure. more coherent about some of, the, some of the ideas that you talked about. Courtesy of the virus, I have all the time in the world. No, no problem. With, yeah. with the greatest of pleasure. Um, yeah. And this time, let's make it more balanced. I'm sure you have uh, as much to contribute as I do. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought some of these messages were really important, not because they oh, came from super me. Super important. But, but, you know, just important. Uh, they have their own being, <laughs> their own design, yeah. these messages. Yeah. So, just let me know when you've uploaded it to your channel so that I can yeah. download it and upload it to mine. Okay. And I'll give you credit and everything. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank All you right. for having me. Uh, I appreciate I'll, it. Uh, I'll schedule with you for the next one uh, over email, okay?